uh, in the next uh, video on going strong for the um, video channel Lex Consilium Foundation, I'd like to ask you, Ambassador, that uh, we are still on uh, India and China. That what is your assessment of Prime Minister Modi's China policy? Well, um, no Prime Minister of India before Mr. Modi had such familiarity with China. That's quite remarkable. Familiarity? Familiarity. Okay. As Chief Minister of Gujarat, he had visited China five times. He did a lot of business. He knew Chinese business, he knew Chinese leadership. He knew China. Something quite remarkable. Something quite remarkable yes. for Prime Ministers. Yes. Especially those who also have an interest in foreign policy. So, uh, <clears throat> and apart from those five visits at CM, his record number of meetings with President Xi Jinping is amazing. He's had 18 visits, 18, 18 meetings, meetings at summit level with Xi Jinping. And these are one to one? One to one. And in the next two months, it will probably come to 20. Because later this month, they might have a meeting in, in uh, South Africa for the BRICS summit. And then uh, the G20 summit, which Prime Minister Modi is chairing, is going to bring. He is also expected to expected attend. As, as, yes. as an important leader, and member of the G20, to attend. So close to 20 uh, personal meetings and some of these uh, summit meetings have been quite elaborate like okay. uh, Xi Jinping's visit to Ahmedabad or to Mahapalipuram you know it took place over a, a period of time not just one meeting now as a seasoned diplomat how do you see what, what are the gains of this okay yes but I have I am a little puzzled if this is the prime minister who knew who knows China so well and is so familiar with China, why is Modi's China policy not very different from the policy of his predecessors? Because I, I, I see continuity, I don't see change. Okay. okay. Even more intriguing, other striking similarities I see between Prime Minister Nehru's approach to China and Prime Minister Modi's. Let's see the similarities. Both invoked the glorious past connections, centuries of contacts between India and China as civilizations. Both uh, dreamt of a, of, a, of a global partnership where China and India will work hand in hand on global issues. Right? And uh, with that, I'm really puzzled that uh, uh, Modi's uh, China policy doesn't appear to be much different. The framework that I mentioned last time, that MEA had drawn up, was basically what is It still stands. Still stands. And Mr. Modi actually hasn't mentioned China in public. This is also remarkable. The opposition uh, says that at least after Galwan, China has not been named. Yeah. So, so this is also puzzling. Now, also intriguing is that Prime Minister Modi's chosen instrument of dealing with China is soft power. That is uh, interesting because our experts, the China experts particularly, they say that the Chinese leaders from Mao to, to, to uh, Xi Jinping do not believe in soft power. They have focused on China's military power, economic power, it is exclusively hard power. And as we analyze the approach of the Chinese leadership to soft power, when, peop when countries talk about uh, friendship or leaders of countries talk about uh, the, the cooperation and friendship, the Chinese regard it as an admission of weakness and inferiority. So why Prime Minister Modi has chosen soft power as his major approach to China is still a bit intriguing. I mean, of course, we have to accept that given the gap in our total national power between India and China, uh, it is discreet 
not to take a confrontational stand. And maybe Prime Minister Modi thought that with his persuasive diplomacy, we could have an accommodation with China. Right. Things, of course, are... are, are Sorry. Uh, yes, I'd like to ask a question here. Uh, there have been a number of foreign secretaries in the last a couple of decades who have had uh, innings in China. They know Mandarin well. It is uh, talked about them. And a number of them have since retired. So they are no more part of the government. Now, Chinese uh, watchers, China watchers, Chinese experts, if I can call them, why is it so that these people who have uh, been in China, who have interacted with them, and now uh, they are not part of the government having been retired, uh, is there some counter view coming up? Well, the counter view uh, is not in terms which, which of... should be discernible as uh, distinct from what the line prime ministers followed so far. Well, you see the, the bureaucracy, and here I bring the EMEA here. The bureaucracy has been associated with the leadership. Uh, and therefore, um, policy on China was as much a contribution of the bureaucracy as the leadership. Yeah. So the same logic was followed. And basically the logic is, we are not strong enough, we can't have a confrontation with China. Let's wait. That's why I called expediency. And I, as I said, expediency was fine at a time when we were in dire straits. But so much more has changed. India has much, much stronger power, acknowledged by the world as a global player. And the point is, the approach of bureaucracy should be different from the approach of the leadership. Therefore, I would place greater responsibility on the leadership. Because, simply because we have a difference in uh, military strength, should not uh, make us accept a position of submission or expediency. If that were so, the Vietnamese would have never dared to fight the Chinese. But they did. There was a colossal difference in strength between the two countries. But they not only fought the Chinese, they defeated them. So that's the lesson I think our leadership should take instead of following the safe line. And maybe there were reasons. I mean, I, I am not privy to all the thinking there. But I think today the time has come when we should look for a course correction at least. Yeah, because uh, you spoke about bureaucracy and you spoke about leadership. That's right. Now, I am pointing at, not at the bureaucrats. Yes. Because bureaucracy, to my mind, ends when a person is superannuated. So, therefore, these diplomats with rich experience who are not part of the state bureaucracy and they are not political leadership. At least uh, their vision, their articulation uh, should also be available as a useful source of information which may either confirm the line which successive prime ministers undertook or should perhaps indicate, may indicate that uh, well this is what it is and perhaps soft diplomacy would not work. Well, What's your response to that? There are, there are two subtle answers to this. One is, if you have been a policy advisor sort of, as, as a bureaucrat, be very difficult for you to admit that I was wrong, that we could have taken a different approach. That's number one. The bureaucracy always protects itself. Okay. Secondly, when it comes to how strong are we to face the Chinese, the MEA will say, we don't know. The armed forces will tell us. The armed forces, in my view, Again, a very personal assessment. Armed forces has gone along with the MEA, with the leadership. Let's fight Pakistanis. We can give them a licking. Okay. Uh, China, let's, let's not talk about China. Uh, I, okay, I, I, so, so there, is, there, is, there is a lot of... Uh, now, the, the same uh, China experts, out of retirement, will say, the relations were fine as long as we were there. But now the situation but is changing. The so, latest, so, latest inputs so are, we are not privy to. So there are many, many clever yeah. answers to that. Yeah. But on the whole, I think, if you look at it from the nation's point of view, yeah. we are at the crossroads when we have to decide how we are going to handle China. Right. Okay. Yeah. Now, um, 
I am saying the leadership should have also taken the signals. There were the signals coming from the China which we chose to ignore. Examples. I will give just two examples. Yes. Uh, <coughs> Xi Jinping comes to Ahmedabad. This is uh, 2014. They have nice discussions. They were having chai pe charcha on the banks of the Sabarmati and so on. At that moment, 1,000 Chinese soldiers had intruded deep into Indian territory at Chumar. Did they get out of it? No, they stayed on with the Chinese president yes. as the guest of honor of the Prime Minister of India. Wasn't that a signal? Okay. But many experts said, oh, no, no, no. In the Chinese system, the local commanders can take this decision and, you know, uh, the president... It's difficult, difficult to buy, yes. Difficult to buy yes. in the case of China. Okay. The second signal that came, Mahabalipuram. Mahabalipuram, where Xi Jinping was subject to lavish hospitality and generous doses of soft power, it went off so well, Xi Jinping declared a hundred-year plan for friendship with India, hunky-dory. Within six months, the Chinese soldiers were coming into different portions of Ladakh, ending with Galwan. Within six months of, of Xi Jinping coming to India. Was that sending a signal to India? I mean, are we so deaf that we didn't listen to it? So I have a feeling, maybe I'm exaggerating, but the signals were there and I, I think we have been slightly unprepared for the turn of events. And it's interesting to see how Prime Minister Modi has reacted post Galwan and it is for us to decipher whether changes are taking place in his thinking and the government's thinking or things are going to be the same. And that is what we are going to discuss uh, okay. later on. Yeah. Uh, in fact, the time is now for us to discuss this last thing that you have said. Okay. Well, firstly, let me see where we stand with China now. Yes. Okay. Where we st st stand with China, let, let me go back to the three sectors that you had mentioned. Yes. So, now, the border situation. 75 years of border negotiations and they are still going on. This is the mother of all border negotiations. Right? It started with uh, discussions between Nehru and Cho and Lai. It continued until uh, at senior officials level, they met to discuss the border. That means our China experts and the Chinese sitting down together and so on. Then government decided to elevate the level from Joint Secretary to Foreign Secretary. So 15 years of discussions at Foreign Secretary level that has taken place. And then, Mr. Vajpayee decides to uh, upgrade it to a political level. So now the NSAs talk to each other every year, right? 17 years, the special representatives, that is the NSAs, have been discussing that border issue. What, what have we achieved after 75 years of negotiations? Zero. Not a single inch of our 4,000 uh, kilometers of border has been delineated. But we are still patient. We are expecting the 19th meeting of the core commanders to take place. And what is the ground situation? The ground situation is that after Galwan, there have been peace efforts and talks at the core commander level. And as it happens, China is sitting on Indian territory because we did a buffer zone agreement. The buffer zones fall solidly within Indian territory. So the Chinese are sitting pretty on our territory while we are talking and talking and talking. The uh, buffer zone gives them justification to be in our territory. In our territory. Yes. And I have a suspicion that that will become ground reality. You know, like the uh, 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 line of control. Not from reality, it would give some sort of a legitimacy of to their presence in our border. Yes. And mind you, we, are, we have stopped talking about earlier occupation of our te territory. Like how they took Aksai Chin through an illegitimate agreement with Pakistan, which involved POK. Yes. We have forgotten what they had occupied, again illegally, 
before Galwan and before this current round of, of, of confrontation. So all that, they are sitting pretty. Imagine there are 65 patrolling points which the Indian army had because that was allowed under the agreements. Do you know we have access to only 25 of them or 26 of them? Yes. The rest of them are out of bounds. Our patrols who are patrolling there are unable to go to the patrolling points. This, this That's a stark reality. That's a stark reality. Now, let's, let's look at the diplomatic front. Nothing new. They are still blocking us everywhere. They are supporting Pakistan by blocking the uh, naming of the terrorists and the terrorist yes. groups. They are blocking our uh, move towards becoming permanent members of the Security Council of the NSG. That's there. Economically, I think the situation has got even worse. Now, remember that, uh, that, that uh, uh, the, the, the trade which, was, which is going so much in China's favor that they have got $75 billion of surplus in one year alone, right? What has now happened is that post Galwan, the, uh, <coughs> the, the, uh, tr uh, during Galwan, the trade was $88 billion. Two years after Galwan, in 2022, guess what is the level of trade? $120 billion. It has increased. It's not decreased. Yeah. And $75 billion is a record deficit. It's not coming down. So we are not decoupling. It's impossible. We are not, not de-risking. We are carrying on. And therefore, I feel the Chinese have now got a stranglehold on the Indian economy because of our dependence. And secondly, in sectors like automobiles, uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, uh, and the, the smartphones, they have a dominant position and they can easily squeeze us. Which is why it's significant that Prime Minister Modi made a breakthrough with the United States and France. The global strategic yeah. yes, global partnership. Global. Yeah. So, so uh, on all these fronts, I think we have not improved the situation very much in the last six years. But when we come to assessment, I will probably give a slightly different picture.